Hmm. There seems to be some activity on the airwaves. Let's just boost that a bit. Yeah, now you can properly hear it. Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about the small game block amplifier that we designed in the previous episode by using it to receive some actual radio signals. But before that we need to make some initial tests to confirm the circuit's operation. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. So last time we looked at the circuit in the simulator. All seemed to be working perfectly. And today I will be going through the main steps of turning this into a practical device, making a complete schematic and board layout and finally building and testing it out. So first things first, I took the design from before and added in a few more components. So first off on the supply side I added in an LED just to highlight that the circuit is supplied. So this is completely optional of course, but it is a good indicator that you might find useful. Then I also added in an extra ferrite bead just to better isolate the signal lines from the amplifier supply and while well, I sprinkled in a few extra decoupling capacitors. Now in the amplifier circuit itself, I left room for some extra components. So for example, the high frequency gain can be limited by using this collector based capacitor and while well, the signal gain can be further controlled and reduced with this emitter resistor. But to begin with at least, I will not be using these components. Now moving on to the board layout, the first thing that you might notice is the strange board shape. We'll come back to this in a moment. But other than this though, everything is placed on a single side. So the second layer is a complete ground layer. And well, for the components, the RF bit, so the components around the main transistor, are packed as tightly as possible with the traces being as short as was possible. And while the supply line, so the various ferrite beads, capacitors and so on, the LED, were not all that critical, so these are a bit more spread out. So the main idea with this shape was that I also wanted to be able to shield the circuit without investing too much into a special shielding case. So the structure that I wanted to use was a bit of copper piping that is commonly used for plumbing or something like that. So what I ended up doing was I cut a small piece of pipe and then I made some notches into it. Now the board slips nicely into this and even though this is not a perfect solution, there are some holes on the side, it does make for a pretty nice construction, especially if you're trying to work on a budget. Now, based on the available pipe you have, the board's smaller width should be smaller than the inner diameter so that it will actually fit in. And while the wide width needs to be equal to the outer diameter so that it all looks nice in the end when the board is inserted, so it's not really sticking out. Now, other than this, I also left some exposed plating on the board to have an electrical contact from the board ground to the pipe so that the shield actually works properly. And well, finally, you could finish this off with a bit of soldering, so just to make sure that there definitely is a contact in between. And you can also add some copper taping just to fill in the gap. But for now, I will just leave this as it is. Now, to verify this amplifier, I did go through multiple steps. So first off, I looked at its DC operating point using a basic multimeter, so to make various voltage measurements and a current measurement. And well, these are fairly similar to what we were getting from our simulation. The current is slightly higher, so we were getting 11.6 milliamps. With a practical circuit, it's 13.5. But the voltages are more or less the same. Next, to observe the wideband operation, I used a span going up to 500 megahertz, and I started looking at the amplifier's output noise. So in yellow, we have the equipment's noise floor, which is fairly low, but we still see the local FM stations in here. And well, when I attach the amplifier with and without the copper shielding, the general noise floor was more or less the same. It was higher than the equipment by itself, but the shield was not really impacting this. However, in the region of the FM stations, there we did get a very clear difference. With the unshielded version, we were getting far more noise. So the shield did make a difference in this area. For the next experiments, 
I used a light VNA to perform the measurements. And the first thing to mention is that I had to add an attenuator on the output of port 1 to limit the injected signal. So since this is a small signal amplifier, if the injected measurement signal is too great, it will end up getting distorted and generating false results. So that is why I used the 20 decibel attenuator before the amplifier. Now if we look at the actual results, starting with the impedances, I plotted out both the absolute impedance as well as the real and reactive part. So we can first have a look at the input impedance, which is quite noisy because of the attenuator. And there also seems to be some sort of measurement error at the beginning. But anyway, afterwards, the measured value is fairly close to the 50 ohms that we were supposed to be getting. So between one megahertz and about 150, it's more or less in the 60 to 50 ohm range. And now looking at our second graph, we can see that most of this impedance is resistive. So there is a reactive part, but it's fairly small. Now moving on to the output port impedance, we are getting a similar story. So except the beginning and the end, over most of the usable frequency range, the impedance of the amplifier is in the 48 to 60 ohms. And this impedance is mostly resistive. So again, there is a small reactive part, but that is not the main component. So using this amplifier in a 50 ohm system should not create too much discontinuity. Next thing to look at is the gain of the amplifier. So we are getting fairly similar values to what we've simulated. The gain is more or less 20 to 21 decibels up to about 90 megahertz, after which it slowly drops off. But even at 500 megahertz, the maximum value at which I measured, we are still getting more than 10 decibels of gain. And well, finally, I looked at the amplifier's reverse isolation. So how much of the signal injected into the output makes its way to the input? The smaller this value is, the more stable the amplifier will be. And well, here, we can see that we are getting a value of about minus 26, 27 decibels, again up until about 91 megahertz, after which the reverse isolation increases a bit. So all in all, this amplifier should be quite stable and provide decent results. Now, before trying this thing out on a real radio, it's important to mention a few things about amplification. Do you actually need it? And what is it exactly that you will be amplifying? Now, playing around with an SDR software-defined radio, I discovered that sometimes a bit of circuitry that lets less useful signal through will actually make the reception better. So the thing to remember about an amplifier, especially a wideband version, is that it does not care what signal you're particularly interested in. It will amplify anything that you feed it. The useful things, say your radio station, but it will also amplify the background noise. The other thing to keep in mind is one of the key parameters of any radio, which is the dynamic range the ratio of strongest to weakest signal that it can usefully process. Normally, the internal automatic gain control circuit will limit amplification so that the strongest input signal is at the compression point, but that just means that any weak signals will get ignored if they are below the sensitivity limit. This is not a problem of limited amplification. This is simply the receiver limiting the gain to protect itself. Point is, that if the station you're trying to listen to is weaker than some other station by more than the dynamic range amount, no extra amplification will ever help, since the amplifier will always amplify everything. Unless, of course, you do something about that. So the key element missing is an input preselector filter, implemented as a bandpass filter. The idea with this is that it will isolate a limited frequency range that contains the signal of interest, say this one, and then this way, the dynamic range is pushed down and hopefully will now contain the signal of interest. If the signal is still too weak, then an extra amplification does make sense, since now the radio will clearly detect the useful signal, which previously was swamped out by the very strong neighboring ones. Now, the input bandwidth of a radio is characterized by its selectivity. Ideally, you want to very tightly limit the input range to just the signal of interest so that the input stage is not overdriven by strong neighboring stations. But in my personal experience with cheap SDRs, 
is that there is no or very limited input filtration since the SDR is supposed to be a very wideband radio. Therefore, the really strong commercial radio signals just overdrive the input stage, so you can't really hear any of the weaker signals. Therefore, simply adding in a bit of input filtration does wonders. And that will be needed before adding the extra amplifier. So I tried out multiple setups for this experiment, with the final one being the most successful. The main thing that I changed was the exact position of the amplifier in reference to the various filters. So I tried to put the filter first, amplifier second, filter second, amplifier first, but the best result was with a dual filter setup, both before and after the amplifier. I guess that this way you stabilize the antenna impedance a bit and also eliminate all sorts of unwanted signals. The complete setup, with which I will be testing out the amplifier, contains a few more things though. I am using a DIY magnetic loop antenna, followed by the initial bandpass filter, so to isolate most of the HF bands, and then the actual amplifier is connected into the system through a set of relay switches, so that we can easily see the impact. I will be inserting and removing the amplifier using these switches, so we have a direct comparison. And then I have, of course, the second bandpass filter that will isolate just the 20 meter band. And finally, this is connected to the SDR, a hacker F receiver that I will be controlling using the computer. Now, just as a side note, even though the HackRF does have a built-in bias T, it is only outputting 3.3 volts. So I will be supplying the amplifier from an external 5 volt supply so that it can operate normally. And well, this is the complete setup. The loop antenna is just thrown over my window. And to this I have the various filters connected, the amplifier, and then finally the SDR. So we have our input filter, we have the relay, the amplifier, and then the final filter. Now all of the blocks are built as standalone modules with SMA connectors, so it's easy to add or remove bits, or just, well, change the order of everything. And even though building like this is not very robust, this thing is quite a flimsy contraption, it's still a good first step before making a final design, or just for testing purposes. So, with everything fired up, we can have a quick look at the wideband performance, mainly of the filters. We can see that most of the RF spectrum is clean, other than some spikes appearing here and there, mainly around the filter's center frequency. And well, when I turn on the amplifier, we get a very clear signal boost. So it's only in the passband region, again confirming the filter's utility. Now, you may already notice that the useful signals also jumped up a bit. We can now have a closer look at this, so if we zoom into some radio traffic, we can see that turning the amplifier on or off has a very clear impact on the useful signal. It is boosted by about 30 decibels, but we also get a boost in the noise floor. Fortunately, this is not the same 30 decibels value, but rather just about 5 decibels. Point is that our signal to noise ratio is getting better. Now, with a commercial radio station that has a very strong signal to begin with, the audio quality does not really change all that much. But there is a very clear difference in some of the weaker ham signals. So, with the amplifier in line, the speech becomes far more clear than when the amplifier has been deactivated. So, even though the amplifier I built isn't perfect, it is usable. With it, I was able to improve my radio's reception and make some of the weaker signals a bit more clear. Now, even though building amplifiers from discrete components will work, and you can get some specific benefits like improved noise or very exact parameters, building with integrated circuit game blocks will usually create less headaches. But that's no fun. And with that said, Hope you got some useful information for this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated on my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.